Hi, good evening, welcome. Uh, my name is Pavel Pish, I'm a curator in the visual arts department and together with Matthew Villar Miranda, the curator of uh, Pol Chan Breathers. Um, it's great to see you all here this evening. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Walker Arts Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. <clears throat> the name of our state, Minnesota, comes from the Dakota phrase, Minnesota Makoche, meaning where the land reflects the clouds. This site, which was once an expanse of marshland and meadow, holds meaning for the Dakota, Ojibwe, and indigenous people of from many other native nations who continue to live in our community today. I'm really happy to welcome two brilliant thinkers this evening, um, also colleagues, but crucially, I think, two friends. So we'll be witnessing a conversation between two people who know each other really well. Um, I won't speak for too long, but I hope that you have a chance to see Paul Chan's exhibition in the galleries. Um, I think the connective thread that we can kick off this evening by thinking about is Badlands Unlimited, the publishing press that Paul founded in 2009, which published 50 titles, uh, works by artists and writers, including Marcel Duchamp, Yvonne Rayner, Craig Owens, also Aruna D'Souza, Etel Adnan, Petra Courtright, Hansel Rick Obris, Martin Sims, and Carol Dunham, and many others. And a selection of works and materials and um, various ephemera relating to Badlands are on view in the show. Um, Aruna D'Souza is a writer and critic whose work appears regularly in four columns and the New York Times. She is the author of this incredible book, which I'm holding here, called Whitewalling, <clears throat> Art, Race, and Protest in Three Acts, published by Badlands in 2018. And it's really an incredible study that reflects on the issues of censorship, free speech, um, and really questions and looks at the way that museums grapple with politics and race. Aruna's recent editorial projects include Linda Nochlin's final volume of collected essays, Making It Modern, and Lorraine O'Grady's Writing in Space. She was the co-curator of Lorraine O'Grady's uh, retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum in 2021. Uh, Paul's show is really thinking about, and its title suggests this, but it's thinking about what does it mean to take a breather, to take a moment of turning away uh, from familiar ways of doing things and trying something new. And the show really celebrates listening to that voice and wanting to turn a page, wanting to try something that you've never tried before. But it's also a show that talks about joy and how we find joy in what we do in, in our lives. And that was really the brief that we gave Paul and Aruna, is to talk about what does that mean? What does it mean to take a breather? And um, how do we hold joy, pleasure, nourishment, rejuvenation in what we do every day, which seems really important. Um, at this time. So with that, uh, welcome all of you and please help me in welcoming Paul and Aruna to the stage. met in the most, what I still think is the most hilarious fashion, which is that I got an email that in retrospect might have been written by some sort of computer bot um, or AI assistant or something like that, um, that said, Paul would like to meet, Paul Chan would like to meet you the next time you come to New York City. Um, please uh, let us know when that's going to be and we'll set up an appointment. And I had never met Paul Chan. I knew of him by because of his artwork, um, but I didn't know much about him. And I contacted a mutual friend of ours, and I said, why would Paul Chan want to have a meeting with me? And he said, he might want you to write a, a book for his feminist erotica series. <laughs> and my 14-year-old child, heard this conversation and said, Mom, there is no way I'm gonna let you write a book of feminist erotica. You embarrass me enough. <laughs> and so 
she insisted, they insisted on coming to the meeting with me. So my 14 year old and I showed up at Paul Chan's office and I, I still don't know in that initial conversation if you ever gave an actual direct reason for wanting to meet with me. It was one of those things where it was like, Paul had a very effective way of making me think that everything was my idea. Um, so <laughs> but by the end of it, um, we had decided that I would write a book. Um, and it wasn't feminist erotica. Um, in fact, it was very unerotic, but it was, um, it was a book about, uh, you know, that in, in a way thinking through the issues of the very controversial 2017 Whitney Biennial. Um, and and it, it was um, it, w w the two things that Paul told me, and I think that this is something that I want to talk about um, to start off with. The two things that Paul told me are um, that he w wants it, he, he publishes books for people who don't read. That was one thing he said, which had a very specific meaning for him. Um, uh, and that he was planning on um, setting the book in a large typeface so that people wouldn't be intimidated by the idea of seeing a wall of text. And so these were, in fact, the two briefs that I got, um, as I said about, and, and that he wanted it to come out very quickly so that it would um, spark um, a, a sort of spark a conversation um, rather than just sum up a conversation. And so um, that was that was the beginning of what was very um, important for me um, uh, editorial relationship with Paul and relationship of, of author and publisher, but also the beginning of a, of a what I consider a very important friendship. But Paul, so I want you to talk about that idea of um, publishing books for people who don't read. I'm happy to. Um, but before we go on, yeah. it's true that you didn't write an erotica, <laughs> but what I want to emphasize is that whitewalling is still a page turner. Thank you. And I think, um, and I think that was part of the conversation we had, mm -hmm. that you're a trained art historian. You did your thesis on Cezanne. Yeah. And so you understand a certain, a certain writing, a certain kind of writing, and a certain kind of book, perhaps within the framework of art history, contemporary art history. And I think what was nice talking to you about white, what eventually became whitewalling was that neither of us wanted that kind of book. Well, we had met, I mean, you know, this was Paul's taking a breather phase of, of really working um, intensively with Badlands. But I, I mean, I don't know if you re realized this at the time we met, but I had also taken a breather. So in 2012, I left my position as an academic art historian, um, and I did, you know, what you're really not supposed to do, which is I gave up tenure, and I decided I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a writer. So for me, um, the idea of untraining myself in art historical writing and training myself in a different kind of writing that had a much uh, wider audience, um, a much more um, uh, interested but not specialist audience uh, was really exactly what I was trying to learn how to do. So this came at a really, you know, uh, uh, you know, this this was an important crossroads I think for me. I have a sixth sense for quitters. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you hadn't quit or you had quit before you had, you would have me, made me quit. <laughs> I don't know if I would have made you. I don't know if I would have the temperament for that. But I can just sense it. Like, oh, she's a. Qu I like her. <laughs> She, she's a quitter. <laughs> no, you know what you know what you liked because actually just recently like very recently like a few weeks ago Paul came and spoke to a class that I'm teaching. I'm in the classroom for the first time in 10 years. And he told them um, the story of how I first came onto his radar, which I had never heard. And it was he had read an article um, that I'd written and I think that you didn't sense just sense that I was a quitter I think you sensed that I was a bridge burner and so <laughs> and so I don't just quit I quit spectacularly so <laughs> I think that was part of it but the writing writing books for people who don't read 
that's what we're talking about right now. Um, it's, it's true and not true. You know, I think um, the ambition of Badlands Unlimited was to publish books that I remember as a kid reading. Mm -hmm. You know, I've said this many times. I didn't grow up reading artist monographs. Yeah. I, I didn't grow up reading catalogs that are $65 and that weigh um, a, like a ton of bricks. Yeah. I grew up reading books that were eleven ninety five that I can put in my back pocket or my backpack. And I think within contemporary art book publishing, I felt at the time, which was 2010, there was room for that. Mm -hmm. That you had your MoMAs and your Guggenheims and your, and your LA MOCAs publishing these beautiful catalogs, arguably beautiful books. Um, uh, but, uh, and also trade publishers who were doing art books. But they didn't have what I considered a, a kind of sophistication and a kind of accessibility that I thought we deserved especially for younger generations of artists and writers. And so I think Badlands tried to fill that gap. I, I remember that the way you described it to me at the time was, at which I found really um, kind of appealing and sweet, uh, was you were thinking about um, people who, you know, young people, maybe artists, people who were interested in the cultural sphere, who were probably working two jobs in order to pay their rent in New York and taking long subway rides out to like the far boroughs and had a you know a little bit of time every day to read some, to keep something in their bag and read it on the train as they were getting to and from their different jobs and 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 so it was it was not people who don't read I should just clarify it was not people who don't read because they're not interested in reading but people who don't read because their lives are are complicated enough um, that that there's that there's not often sort of the time or space or the type of books that they might be able to like consume in that in those sort of snatches of time um, yeah exactly yeah. I think it's um I, I put it in a piece of writing another way maybe more broadly that I think culture in general broadly takes time to appreciate takes time to understand and takes time to enjoy. And if you're too busy working two, three jobs, if you're too busy trying to make money for rent or your, a meal or taking care of a relative or, or a loved one, you may not have the time to put in to get the kind of what we would want to get out of culture broadly, you know? So I think, I think, Again, the ambition of Badlands was to make interesting, accessible, culturally sophisticated books that I think people with no time can maybe partake in. So someone can read the Duchamp interviews that we did or whitewalling um, on a subway ride, you know, from Brooklyn to New York on the F train. You know, I think that we really, we really thought about it in terms of um, travel time, you know, and this isn't out of the blue. There's a long history, in particular, the, the books uh, by Olympia Press. Maurice Giadis's Olympia Press used to publish in the 50s and 60s this beautiful set of erotic books called the Traveler Companion series. And there are these new lo the New Lovers books was in part inspired by this Traveler Companion series. They were small green, all, they were all green, and um, they were all stylized, they were all looked the same. And Giadis was trying to publish people like Samuel Beckett, Ionesco, Aeneas Nin. But no one bought those books. So he thought he would publish erotica to subsidize his more adventurous uh, uh, projects. <laughs> and he published them so that people taking the train from France to, 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 to the UK would be able to read it on the train. That's why they called it the Traveler Companion series, you know? They were the Traveler's Companion, which I thought was beautiful. Also, there were censorship laws in the UK at the time, so he couldn't publish those kind of books. So, so he would publish English books in France so that people in the UK can buy them and take the train to read them, which I thought was incredible. Um, and it's sort of, but that sensibility of um, time and the uh, sort of the accessibility of um, of reading 
um, is reflected in the catalog of the show. I love, I, you know, the f- minute I got the catalog, the first I post things on Instagram, the first thing I posted was the table of contents, which has um, the reading time for each of the essays in the book. And I, I posted and I said, this is pure Paul Chan. This is pure, this is, <laughs> because it's, because it was, it was not just the sort of enumeration of um, the reading time, but the but the sensitivity to, and of course the designers of the book and the curator and everything like that, of of, of course. But it it was an allusion to the the idea that w- we aren't just we aren't just people of leisure, right? Um, even if we even when we do take breathers, or even if we do try and conceive our our work outside of the outside of the. Um, outside of the terms of production, time is still finite um, for us, so. Absolutely, it's the only non-human thing I refuse to lose. It's really true, I can lose everything. Non-human, I can lose money, I can lose attention. I think I can even lose a leg, I think. (laughs) That's a human thing though, so we don't have to worry about it. But I can't, I refuse to lose time. It's the only thing I care about losing. So, and with that specific gesture in the catalog, I'm glad you like it. People have said that. People have sent me pictures of it. It's interesting. But, you know, to me, it's like a way of taking care of the reader. You know, I'm just giving you a heads up that if you're going to read the colophon to understand who the donors are and who made this and who funded it, it's going to take like a minute and a half. Well, but you know that's I mean? but that's why I mean that's why I I think of it as pure Paul because and that that first description of the people that you're writing books for the people who have only so much time on the train, right? Like that those are gestures of of care and of understanding of like what people's lives are or what the people you care what the lives of the people you care about are. Yeah, in the in the best of what we call culture, I think. We hope that whatever whatever experiences we're a part of, whether it's a book or an exhibition, you feel broadly that it's 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 um, you they're holding you somehow, whether it's your attention or a certain idea in play, you know, and uh, it's important, you know. I liken it to how you know. I remember when we were talking about whitewalling. I don't know if you remember this, but I'm I'm obsessed about margins on a page. I hate books with little margins. They have to be at least a, a quarter of an inch proportional to the page size. It's, I, I, I won't even read a book if the margin is too thin because what happens is you, you, you hold the book and your thumb is blocking the words. Do you know what I mean? And invariably, with those thin margins, also the font size is really small, which is hard. I hate that. I won't even read books that are under 14 inch, 14 size type, you know? The, what's really funny is uh, uh, if six months ago or so, I um, connected with a, a friend who I hadn't seen since we went to high school together. I hadn't seen then, and he now is, you know, some works in biochemistry or something like that. And um, he was coming to DC and said, oh, let's have lunch. And so uh, he showed up with whitewalling because he cool. he had said, you know, I need to catch up on what Arun has been doing all of this time. And the he had he very sweetly, he had made notes about what he was, in, what interested him and what questions he had about the book. It was very sweet. And, but he, the top things that he wrote down were, were I like the contrast of the of the uh, type to the white paper. I like the size of the margins. I like the f- font that is used. Like it was all about the book design. And what was so funny is I was uh, just telling Pavel before this that the that the process of writing this book was different than anything I had experienced um, at writing an academic book, because Paul said, you know, it needs to come out within a year of um, the uh, 2017 Whitney Biennial. It needs to, and in order to do that, we need to get the title, the blurb, um, and all of these details in place within 
three weeks of our initial conversation. And uh, so he was going on with like the, you know, we had this back and forth about the title that I'm pretty sure took longer than the actual writing of the book. Um, and he was like, you know, doing doing the, the cover design and everything like that. I wasn't even noticing because I was so panicked about trying to get a book written, right, in this in this period of time. How long was it? It was like two months, two and a half months. How I, long I wrote it? the first draft in six weeks and Crap. I wrote the I wrote the you know the revised copy in two months. I'm yeah. So it sorry. Was, it was really like, you know, it I worked never out though. It I'd never done anything like that before and I literally had to go to physical therapy after for my <laughs> because of my shoulders but there's um, no health insurance with badlands i know <laughs> there is no i know okay, exactly just so you know <laughs> so it was um but it was it was it was such a it was such a interesting for me it was great because it meant that i had no time to slip into my bad art historical habits um i had to you know i kept thinking like I'm writing a New Yorker essay, not a not a peer reviewed journal article. And that really helped in terms of like figuring out. But um, what what was funny is that the book came out and, you know, I don't know, my mom or something, I sent her a copy and my and my mom was like, Your name isn't on the title. And I was on the on the on the cover, and I said it isn't. I hadn't even noticed because I was so I ha because it seemed like such an obvious like it seemed like such a logical cover for the subject of the book that I hadn't even sort of processed the fact that yes, most books have a title on the cover or they have a title you know an author's name on the cover, and this didn't have that. And even your your catalog here, which is so beautiful is so beautiful um your catalog here has a very unusual cover as well i think it's for your book i'm not i'm not a historian of trade publishing but i'm not aware of a trade paperback where the cover is just blank yeah. and i think that was part of my bid to make the book iconic yeah and i think because um if it's good enough people will talk about it but it has to be memorable in another way and i thought since the book is called whitewalling, why not just have like a dirty wall with like a square on it, you know? So it doesn't need, w there's no words on it. It's, there's words on the spine and the back. Yeah. That's all the sort of didactic information is there. Yeah. But why not just make it blank, you yeah. know? It was, it was a great idea. It was so great that I didn't even notice what was missing. So, you know. But I want to shift gears a little bit because um, there's so much to talk about in the show. But one of the things that... Um, well, first of all, I didn't know that you made a book that was a stone tablet, which is hilarious. Thank you. But <laughs> and, and also, I think I probably gave one of the walkers, like, security guards a heart attack by trying to, like, slip back behind it to read the actual story. Um, you so that was it. really, okay. that was really, that was, that was actually really mean, <laughs> the way you've installed it Stop. so that it's not, <laughs> that it's not easy, easy to read. But, um. One of the things also... You know why we did that. Why? Because the page two on the back isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so we made it as hard as possible for you to get around it. <laughs> it's true. So, so of course, I posted, I posted on Instagram pictures from the show. And um, the artist Emily Jessier, the first thing oh, that yeah. she said was, it doesn't look like Paul took a break at all. <laughs> So I thought that was really funny. And so I want you to talk about like this idea of taking of, of taking a breather in relation to this process of, you know, making work. You mean you want to know if Emily's right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I want to know if Emily's right. Emily scares the shit out of me. And so she I should scare I, you. I know, exactly. She's but great. um <laughs> but um i I've written on her and she's a lovely person and she does amazing things, but um, but when she said that, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to get the answer to that. So yeah. Um, I don't get rest from resting. I think we all need rest, but I don't feel renewed from rest per se. Um, I feel renewed when I am uh, doing something that I don't know how to do and, uh, and trying to figure it out. And, and it doesn't feel like work. 
what it feels like is a renewal of my sensory capacities. I think when we feel tired, one of the, th one of the things that makes us feel tired is that we feel our senses, and when I say senses, I mean not only the Aristotelian senses, the five senses, seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, touching, but also what, um, s what, what, um, what doctors and social scientists called introceptive senses. You know, Arist intel uh, we're, we conventionally understand our senses being the five senses, the big five. But since at least the 70s, it's, it's clear um, that we, we also have a set of senses within us to tell us what's happening inside us. And um, that's called interocep interoception. It's the interoceptive senses. It's actually, fa research-wise, it's fascinating. It was, it was pioneered by, by the VA, the VA hospital, because soldiers coming back from Vietnam were having issues um, going back into society through PTSD and what they went through the war. And there was a lot of um, disassociation. They felt as if they weren't part of their own body. And so... And so the VA research pioneered this notion that we, we not only have the five senses, but we have inner senses. And, and so one of the senses is your heart rate. Mm -hmm. Like we all know that we can feel when a heart is racing or not, you know? That's a sense. Hunger is a sense. Uh, Preproception is a sense. It's the capacity for us to know where our arms, our, our appendages are without actually seeing them, you know? Like, I can feel my hand back here. That's a sense, mm -hmm. right? There is what was normally called gut sense, your intestinal sense. Yeah. So, so, so depending upon the research, there are arguably at least 21 interotypes of senses that tell you what's happening inside you. Blood pressure is a sense. So I feel like when we're tired, we feel as if our senses are either being deprived or depleted. And so rest, not what we conventionally call rest, like sleeping, for instance, which is very important. And clearly now, as we understand it, you need sleep or you will die. Yeah. You will literally die, you know. And so, and so the question then becomes, what can you do to renew your senses? And it may be sleep. It may be cocaine. It's not cocaine. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. My daughter's here. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. It may be many things. Sorry, Rue. Um, but I think it's a question. What can you do that allows you to renew those senses, like all of them? Not only the big five, but the interoceptive senses. And I think working on Badlands was a renewal of my senses. It sort of gave me a new reason to make things. It 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 socialized me with other people. It, you know, I, I typically use work by myself in the studio. But Badlands was like a theater production. Like I, l I met you. I've met so many artists and writers to, uh, as we were working. It was um, it was very social. It was much more social than I'm used to, which renewed me in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't say I'll go back to it, but I loved it. You know. And so that's the question. Yeah. The other thing that really, I mean, that I think uh, was very striking in the show is just how deeply art historical um, the show is in the sense of, you know, over here there's some Matisse and over here there's some Cezanne and over here there's, you know, an Annunciation scene and uh, over here there's, you know, even in the, um, the, the the pieces with the um, power cords and projectors, you know, those power cords um, speak to all sorts of uh, different sort of, you know, history of abstract painting, right? Geometric abstraction, and and um, there's a real and and uh, there's a real love for it, I think, but also you know this sort of ability to play with all of these sort of histories and forms and ideas um, and even play with your own capabilities like the the contrast between uh, the portrait of Saddam Hussein versus the drawings um, on the you know sort of opposite side of that room the mo more recent um, large-scale pen and ink drawings um, tied to various contemporary events you know y you seem to to take all of these things as opportunities to to kind of um, explore yes I think but also play 
Um, so can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, I was I just did a walkthrough with the teen group at the Walker. So there's a teen group the Walker works with. There are maybe 20 of them, you know. And um, I worked with them last week, and then I did a walkthrough of them just now. And a couple of the teens said what they appreciated most was how different the different forms are. And um, and I think what I told what I told her was uh, was that um, it's fun, and also it puts into play all the different ways in which art can exist. And I think broadly speaking, that's the pleasure I get out of making things. Um, you can s you can say it's a mix of high low, but really it's almost to me platonic. Um, you know that I'm allergic to philosophy, so you're going to have to explain that a sure. little more. Yeah. Um, Plato's hateful. No one should read Plato. <laughs> Let me just say that. No one should read Plato. But if you were to read Plato, um, <laughs> and you get over the fact that he's hateful and almost two degrees away from authoritarianism, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about him is that since there is something called the idea which no one can touch, no one can see. It's the ideal form of everything. Uh, since, since there's this thing called the idea, which is an ideal form, everything on earth, everything that is this, is a, is a pale imitation of that idea, mm -hmm. right? Which is very cruel, frankly. But a non-cruel way of thinking about it is that if this is the case, then everything here is equidistant to, to, the, to, to its relationship to this ideal form of the divine. And so to me, um, your attentiveness with the c canonical art history mm -hmm. is, is, is of the same level of significance as the, the color orange in the Popeyes franchise yeah. on Fifth Avenue. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean they're equal, it means they're just simply equidistant from its capacity to be significant. Yeah, it's right? it's like art, 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 you know, these art historical models are just one material out of many that you're playing with. Yes. Um, e which seems, you know, which seems great um, and also kind of fun and also, um, you know, at different points very moving. And, and you know, I, I so Paul and I, and um, Paul's uh, partner and his daughter and uh, had a very funny conversation last night because I was insisting in the car in the car Are you about in the car in the car oh we my had God. a very funny conversation because I said you know I'm really glad that I'm really glad that um, people are going to get to see just how. Um, I meant sentimental in a different way. How deeply felt and how sincere you are uh, by looking at this show. And of course, the three of them just burst out laughing. Like this is the funniest She's thing that they'd right ever now. heard. Ruby is laughing right now. <laughs> Rue looked at me and said, you know what? You're actually hilarious. <laughs> but, 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 you know, there, but I, I, there is, to me, there is something so um, genuinely moving, I will say, about your willingness to put your your curiosity, like to sort of, it, to, 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 to reveal your just curiosity about the world, that there's something very vulnerable about it, right? And one thinks like, well, all artists do that, right? Like all artists, you know, put their curiosity on display, but there's something I feel different about the way that that it works here, that you're just, you know, you're willing to turn around and try anything. And it feels like you're you're doing it f very much for your own, um, finding your own mechanisms for processing the world um, and finding your own, um, finding your own ways of, of dealing with, you know, something, you know, things that are really hard to deal with, whether it's like the horrors of the, you know, COVID pandemic or um, the horrors of, you know, the political landscape and, um, you know, or uh, the, the, the kind of um, real difficulties and futilities sometimes or what feels like futility of finding solidarity, which I think the um, anabasis, is that the title, the title of that, the most recent, I think, of the breathers really speaks to as well. I, I appreciate that. I really do. 
Um, yeah, so stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, and maybe the only thing I'll add to that is that um, um, I feel like, I, I genuinely feel like I have nothing to lose. Do you know what I mean? Because I already tried to throw away my career once. <laughs> and I but nearly <laughs> went bankrupt but publishing but books. So I've got nothing to <laughs> lose. <laughs> but what I want to know is every time you think you're throwing away your career, you get some other big prize. So I think that this should be like more of a strategy than anything. Like I think everyone here should just take that away with them. You know, I just talked to the <laughs> teens about that. Because one of the teens asked me, like, how are... Um, how can I succeed? As, it's a great question. It's a very basic, fundamental question. Like, if I want to be it's an artist... It's a question of survival, yes, right? Yes. If, if, if I'm going to be an artist, how am I going to succeed? And um, to me, it's not an answer, but it's a counterintuitive way of thinking about it. For me, was that um, you, uh, you don't... Th it's not the success you should be aiming for. It's the attentiveness and experience that you gain from doing something that you care about and uh, and can focus on to a point where it may not matter whether you succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a, that's a much more interesting and maybe more open-hearted metric about what it means to make anything, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it may be slightly cruel because in the times of such social inequality, I think we all have to try to find and make a living. Yeah. And I understand that, you know? But on the other hand, we know that trying to make a living is killing people. Yeah. It's just self-evident. And so I'm not saying you shouldn't get a job. I may be saying you shouldn't focus on success. In my experience, focusing on, focusing on success only led to disaster. <laughs> it only led to the wrong metric of understanding what was worth doing. And I think if you have enough of your sensory capacities, for uh, not only your big five, but your interoceptive senses, I trust that you'll have the cognitive sense to know which way to go, to have the vigilance to know which way to go, because you're more honest about what's happening inside you and also what's around you. Okay, this is sounding dangerously close to mindfulness culture, though. I just have to put it out there i'm sorry <laughs> it's not it's not a culture although i will be starting a zoom session <laughs> every sunday <laughs> at 4 30 p.m eastern standard time um you know what's what's funny is paul always tells people falsely by the way it's it's, it's his own um you know hope um, that this is true, but it's not really. But he always tells people that he published me so that I would never be able to write about his work. And I was just thinking... That's not the whole story. Well... <laughs> that's you telling... That's <laughs> a <laughs> you going to tell the whole who, story? Who heard him say this last night at the reception? He s said it to at least two people. That I said I saw it to that. many people. Yeah, exactly. They might have all so, heard the story already. So, which is true if I was just writing from, like, you know, if I was trying to write in, like, some criticism journal. But what I realized, actually, when I was sitting there looking at um, the sculptural... Um, pieces uh, that take the form of the breathers, but um, in a sort of um, uh, in th in in stasis, um, and that you've combined with other um, materials um, on the shelves on the wall. Uh, that you know, there's nothing stopping me from writing about you as an art historian, and actually, I really have this really deep urge to write about you from a really art historical point of view um, because uh, you are, you're, you're doing something like, I'm pretty sure I could get a grant for writing a book on Paul Chan and glitching of art history, the glitching of art history or something like that. It's such a bad idea, Runa. I, <laughs> I just want to, I'd be the last person to give career advice, but it's <laughs> such a terrible <laughs> idea. But, <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but I want, but I do. It hurts though, doesn't it? This sort of bind that you found yourself in. I know. It's it does. True. It does. 
I want because you know why. <laughs> Where? <laughs> you gonna tell him the whole story? Y- you tell him the story. That uh, the story that I tell publicly is that um, when I met Aruna, um, uh, I knew that she was a formidable art critic, and that at some point she'll have to trash me because I make <laughs> questionable work at best. And so m- my idea was to publish her and to publish a great book by her so that she'll never be able to criticize me <laughs> in the publication because she can never write about me because it's a conflict of interest because I'm but her publisher, but, but which has worked. But academia doesn't... It's one of the plans that's worked. Academia doesn't believe in conflict of interest. I, so still, <laughs> I still think it's going to happen. They're not going to do it. It's like, no, he's your publisher. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but um but i want to i want to um i think we're probably at the point that we should be um turning things over to uh the audience and asking some questions so there's um microphones c- around so just if you have a question um just put up your hand and we'll get a microphone to you and while we're doing that, I just want to acknowledge how beautiful the shadow is on the sign interpreter. Hello. Right Hi. Here. Hi. Uh, really enjoyed the show, look, going through it, looking forward to going back after this. Um, I've only seen your work on in pictures, and so seeing it all in person was a really great experience. A lot of the stuff was from different eras and times when you were making things. And I'm curious, like, as you bring a bunch of works that are f- from, like, uh, they look like different collections, as it were, you know, and then seeing them back up in a new space with maybe the newer things you made, do you find yourself building, like, different relationships with, like, a work from 2017 or something like that? Like, and now, how you felt then to, like, seeing it now, and especially in either compared or contrasted with, the new work that's up in the same space? That's a great question. I think what I think about is my conversation with Pavel about um, about the n- arguments non-projections room. That's the room with the wire works. Yeah. Those were made before the breathers. Right. Um, and I actually, I actually, th- I actually didn't think that room was going to work. It was Pavel who, who, really kind of talked me into really expanding that room and to really show them. And it works beautifully, and I have Pavel to thank for that. But also, I can see the echoes of how those works then went into the breathers, using the shoes, using the wires. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I'm very fond of the idea that I I like to, frankly, just abandon works and start something else. But honestly, you don't get too far. You know what I mean? You're always going to carry something. If you were attentive enough in working on something and then abandon it, it's going to come with you any, anyways. So, and I have to sort of trust that process and to try to abandon it as, as much as I can to see what carries over. It was also interesting, I noticed just two days ago, that in the, in the, breather, in the bathers room where the colorful breathers are, I call that room the Daytona Beach 1997 room. <laughs> That uh, the models, the 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 muslin models yeah. on hang on the wall, that's like hung eye height with with fabrics um, on the bottom. One of them has a ninety has a has a plastic bag that we made for Badlands. <laughs> that also I realized was the big bag in the first room hanging on top of the installation. It, it never occurred to me. That didn't occur to you? No. I, I like just used it. That's the thing we all see when we're walking. I in know. There, right? I know. <laughs> I'm not that bright. <laughs> but it was like two days ago. Oh my God, that's the same. Like, wh- what did I do? But this, this, um, your discussion just now of the of the arguments and projections room in relation to the ba- uh, to the breathers. Uh-huh. Um, there's a very beautiful description of those arguments and projections as as works on strike. Mm. Um, and then you have this idea of the breather, and I wonder if you like just quickly might say something about the relationship between strikes and taking breathers. Different by degree. Yeah. Right. I think with the wire works, it was really the idea of can you make a work 
before the image gets to the projector and 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 without using the projector you know i i really i spent many years making projection works and i love them and there are many artists who make beautiful projection moving image works but i can't be one of them anymore cuz i resent video projectors <laughs> You know, one of the works I have it makes it looks like the video projector has urinated on a piece of cardboard. You know, I have a very complicated relationship with projection. You know, so I needed to manifest it somehow. Other questions? Other questions for Paul? Oh, I, one of our distinguished guests down here would like oh, to ask maybe. a question. Oh, sorry. Maybe the next one. Next, next down here. Thank you. Uh, I was curious um, how you two think we should consider the next fresh in-person art experience, and what and, and as things reset post-COVID, uh, what kinds of cultural things should we leave behind, and what kinds of things should we bring with us into the future? Museums, galleries, art fairs, and Web three. Whoa. That's on you, please. <laughs> Whoa. Well, I'd like to get rid of art fairs, first of all. Can we get rid of art fairs? They're, they've come back stronger than ever, actually, so that's sad. But um, I think that um, for, for me, I'll answer the question maybe a little differently than, than what you said. I think what we saw um, during the COVID pandemic, what we saw, what we saw spectacularly, was the failure of the state um, to take care of its people. Um, what we saw, what we maybe saw personally, what we maybe saw just in our um, in our own networks, was the level of um, mutual care um, that um, that existed and that kept literally kept people alive, and. I would love for the art world to um, take seriously what that means. And, and, you know, I think there are lots of different levels of the art world, and I don't think that art fairs are the place that that will happen or should happen. And God help us if it does happen, because it would be a complete bastardization of the idea. But there are levels on which the, that, that kind of that, that understanding of care um you know is manifest and and you know even in these gestures like paul caring for his readers um you know by by printing the times right like i think those moments where you see that um are really to me i find you know this may be a function of old age or it may be a function of like you know just exhaustion of what we've all been through and seen um in you know, really our lifetimes now that I, I just really appreciate those moments where I feel like, you know, my, you know, my humanity is, or my, my being is acknowledged and not taken for granted. And so, you know, that's, that's what I'm really drawn to at the moment. I, you know, I keep, people keep, you know, I keep writing about art that I'm like, you know, this art moves me, and like, who am I? I'm not, like, I grew up, I'm Gen X, like, I'm not moved by things, right? Like, you know, <laughs> but that's who I am now, right? And I think it's just the, you know, seeing that it can happen and wanting to see where it does happen. But we have a question up here from Paul's most um, effective interviewer. Okay. So <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> so <laughs> sorry, one second. <laughs> okay. Do you consider yourself a sincere person? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm sorry I had you. <laughs> I'm glad you did. You're, gr you're grounded. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you after this. Answer the question. <laughs> Am I 
a sincere <laughs> person. I can be. I think, you know, I can be. I can be insincere too. I can be angry. I think it's the spectrum that I think I want. Not to be too serious about it, you know. It's it's like the sensory capacity thing. I think if if we have our full sensory capacity, we should be able to be sincere when we need to and be insincere when we want to and angry when we need to and happy and joyous when we want to. I think all that all that spectrum of capacity should be available to us as full-fledged citizens of the 21st century. Yeah, except that I think that one of the things that really, to me, marks your work is that you don't undertake anything that you don't feel very strongly about. And, you know, and that, and it takes very different forms um, and often very different mechanisms to make happen. Uh, but it all comes, all of those things become tools in this sort of larger, um, larger sense of not wanting to waste time. I don't disagree. And the time part is true. The thing now, it connects to the notion of play. Because what you said, I want to believe in, except that it makes it sound like I know what I'm doing. And so, and so in a way, I'm, I, am, I am trying out those sentiments and trying to make them as persuadable as possible to see how it fits. And whether or not it fits will depend upon the capacity of play. So that if I try it on and it feels right, maybe I'll take it with me. But if it doesn't, then maybe I'll leave it behind. But I'm trying to make it persuadable to me, right? And I think that's where, that's where it becomes a real experiment. And also, this is where the renewal comes from, mm -hmm. right? Because weirdly, I think about stories about friends or family, friends who say that they grew up not um, being told that they can't be angry because it's not polite. Because well, it's not South Asians in the house. <laughs> because it's not it's not socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. But and, and you know, but we know that there are situations in our lives when it's appropriate. Not only is it appropriate, but it's important to be angry. It's necessary, yeah. And because it's w because it triggers our sensory capacities, we feel threatened. We feel angry about something. It's important to have that capacity. It doesn't mean you should always be angry. Mm -hmm. It only means that you should have the capacity for it. Mm -hmm. And, but how do you know you have that capacity unless you try it on, yeah. right? Unless you have experience with it. And once you have experience with it, you'll, you'll then gain the insight into knowing when you ought to be angry, whether you have the capacity to be angry. And that's, I think, very, again, it's the sensory capacity, right? So in a way, aesthetics is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the persuadability of a sentiment made real, but not yet present. Try that one. I, I was going to say the only thing I'm more allergic to than philosophy is aesthetics. And yet, we spend a lot of time talking about this stuff together. Super cool. Because <laughs> it's super cool. What are we going to talk about? The Nets? <laughs> like the Knicks? It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any more questions before we... Anyone else with a question? Okay. Thank you. Would you, you ever want to do a public conversation about how terrible the Nets are? <laughs> the Brooklyn Nets? Do you watch basketball? No. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> In that case, yes. Then okay. I would like to have that <laughs> public that conversation. Good. I'll do it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, in the beginning of the conversation, you talked about time and that it's the one thing you wouldn't, you're not willing to lose. And I'd like to know more about how you came to that understanding or that practice. And if you could just share more about your thoughts on that. Sure. It's fairly simple. And I've said this before, um, but I've come close to death twice. Once when I was young. I, 
I actually wrote about it in the catalog. Um, uh, and, and, and once in a zone, in a, in a war zone. And I, I, not to be too overly dramatic about it, it sounds over, uh, already... Sounds I'm pretty dramatic, sorry. Paul. <laughs> um, I think in a way, when you have an acute sense of your own mortality, I think, um, th- I think um, other paths open. You just, other, the perce- the pers- your perceptions change. Also, your sense of time changes. And it's not good. It's not. It's, it may be terrible. It may be awful, actually. Because time, time feels, um, time has a substance to it at that point. I don't know how else to describe it. Other people have described it. Um, and so, but you kind of have to, f- a, y- y- the capacity for that path is taken. So I think that's fundamentally where it comes from. Um, I, I don't want to suggest that people who haven't had acute sense of mortality can't have that. I think they can. I, I, and I think for me, what is underwritten by that is a, a full full birth of your sensory capacities, your big five and interoceptive senses. It's not just that, but a large part of it for me is that. But it does, it, it, um, it gives it a kind of, and this is going to sound strange, but a kind of purpose. It's, I need it Sounds because. So <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. My God. That was for Reese It's benefit. just, and I think everyone should have pleasure and joy and sensory renewal. It's very, I mean, that's how we renew ourselves. But I think having an acute sense of your mortality gives it, kicks it up to a, another gear, I think. This whole conversation about time makes me uh, well, is going to prompt me to go back and um, think about what still is one of my favorite projects that you ever did before you took the break. You mean white walling? No, <laughs> not uh, no. Um, which is um, waiting for Godot in New Orleans, um, because obviously, um, you know, the play itself, waiting for Godot, uh, but also the the context of New Orleans post Katrina. Um, and the idea of time and waiting and the sort of stasis, unnatural stasis of time um, was so um, shot through that project. For those of you who don't know about this project of Paul's, it involved a long-term engagement with um, the city of New Orleans after Katrina and bringing the Harlem Repertory Theater, is that what it's called? The Classical Theater classi- Harlem. Classical Theater of Harlem, uh, down to New Orleans where um, they staged um, multiple um, performances of uh, Beckett's play Waiting for Godot. And it's it's really a, an amazing project, um, not just for the result, but for the, the engagement and the uh, kind of building of community over time, um, but a community that had 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 sort of been stuck um, because of um, the government inaction. So, uh, I I you know just for th- for anyone who's interested in this aspect of Paul's work, I would say, please do look that up that project up. What she said. <laughs> Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I was trying to think of a cerebral question, but instead I can only think of a story that happened when Paul and I were working together for the exhibition. (laughs) We were actually taking a lunch break, and I think at one moment I was like, oh my gosh, I need a breather. And then Paul looked at me and said, really sincerely, (laughs) that if I designed my own doctor's notepad, that he would prescribe me a breather and have it notarized. (laughs) So that turns into another question, what I think is more fun is that I'm wondering who or what both of you, Aruna and Paul, would prescribe a breather to. (laughs) Dr. D'Souza. 
Who would you just prescribe a breather to? God. Okay, you s- you go first. I'll only go if you call me Dr. Chan. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Chan, you go first. <laughs> I don't I know why cuz she's in the news. I would prescribe a breather to uh, Nancy Pelosi. I think she needs a breather. Yeah. I think I she needs a long breather. Yeah, that's that's a good one. You took the best answer, I think. I don't think so. But no, I, I mean, I, you know, I would I would say right now that, you know, but this doesn't come out of care. You sort of want your breath. You want to prescribe breathers to people who actually you want to continue breathing. So <laughs> the top, <laughs> the top, <laughs> the like my the top obvious answers are all people that you know could probably drop dead tomorrow without me really worrying about it. Wow. But I know Any names? I'm a dark person List? Uh, ultimately. List of names. Um it could be a you want to die. I just what? three. Just three. Three names of people <laughs> you want to die. Oh, come on. There I mean I, I bet initials? if we took a poll out the door just and you all named your top three, mine two of mine would definitely be on there. Um <laughs> <laughs> so um I, you know, that's 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 a really um beautiful question. I would I would prescribe a breather to all of the black women who have been working so damn hard over these last years to keep us afloat as uh, as like human beings um because they deserve that rest so that's who i would say that's a that's a big um prescription pad that's all i'm gonna say will you make it matthew (laughs) sorry i don't want to put more work on you never mind (laughs) never mind i'll make it um are there any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you so much for indulging our um, silliness. And uh, thank you to Paul for actually getting very real. Thank I you, appreciate Aruna. that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>